Okay, so we left off roughly at the Battle of the Pyramids. Now, now I talk about the entire Egyptian campaign as far as when Napoleon is there is really only from 1788 to 1789. I mean, in a way, it's just it's a blip in his own personal history. It's a blip in the history of France, but at least for the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic world, it is, you might call it a moment of reckoning. Um, there were other campaigns too simultaneously. Uh, France was conquering what were then called the Illyrian provinces. Um, you know, essentially what we would consider today to be sort of the, uh, the southern Balkans or the westernmost reaches of Ottoman Rumeli, the European provinces, uh, roughly what is now kind of uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Albania. Um, there was some fighting there. There was some fighting on the Ionian Islands in the Adriatic. Um, that is where, in fact, so egregious was this sort of insult to the Ottoman Empire, so great was the Napoleonic threat now that the Ottomans actually allied with Russia for several years. And they actually fought a joint campaign against the French in the Adriatic. Um, it must be said, though, of the Ottomans, like all of the other countries forming these various coalitions, they were somewhat opportunistic. They didn't declare war on France until after Nelson had sunk the French Navy at the Battle of the Nile. Understandably, because obviously France was much stronger. But you see, that was kind of the point in a way. France was now able to occupy the richest of all the Ottoman provinces, more or less at will, it seemed. I mean, after all, this was an army of the Battle of the Pyramids, just 20,000. The entire French army by this stage was 600,000. So it was just a tiny portion of the French army. Now, let's say they did eventually lose. I mean, they, they spend a year in Egypt. And like I said, they did a lot of stuff. I mean, they, again, the Rosetta Stone allowing them to decipher hieroglyphics because it was a little bit like one of those Bibles where they had print in three different languages, like the famous Ladino Bible of the early 16th century. Um, it took them a while to figure it out, but some of the scholars with a kind of British team, they did eventually decipher the Rosetta Stone, allowing them to, again, read ancient hieroglyphics. They made all kinds of discoveries of ruins and so on. Meanwhile, they're setting up these kind of cultural and scientific institutes in Egypt. You know, they're trying to kind of Frenchify the country um, to bring their own idea, idea of civilization to Egypt. Um, there's a culture clash, though. Not just is there a major uprising at the al Azhar Mosque that the French suppress with great brutality, um, but actually there, there's some fascinating interchange, particularly regarding uh, women. Uh, you know, again, not least because for the Egyptians, it's kind of shocking to see th there aren't that many French women who come along, but there are a few. And they're a little shocked to see the French women, you know, with their décolletage and, you know, showing skin and all of this. But meanwhile, the French, too, are a little bewildered by the fact that you know, the women have to be you know, hidden in these kind of robes and you know, obviously kind of like the, the flowing burqas and so on. That said, there are some Egyptian women who venture into the French camp. And Napoleon, at one point, as the story goes, was worried about discipline because too many of the local women were you know, basically kind of like entertaining the French soldiers in camp. And he didn't want to create a cultural incident, and so you know, he went to the local Ah, the kind of police chief in Cairo, and he said, look, I'm having some discipline problems in the army, so you know, can you please deal with the problem? Make sure that the women don't you know, enter the French camp. And there might have been something getting lost in translation, because what the Ah did was he took all of these women and had them drowned in the Nile. Or as the tradition went, they were thrown in sacks, and then drowned in the Nile. And Napoleon, I mean, for all his faults, was sort of a lover of women, we must say, and he was not terribly happy about this. So there were all kinds of cultural friction and tensions, and the French at first thought that they would be welcomed. Obviously, that wasn't true. Um, then they ruled by force, to a certain extent by terror. Yes, they had some help, obviously, from you know, ambitious locals. And they did put down some roots. I mean, you know, I think Mehmet Ali is probably Kavallala, you know, he is the great, in some ways the greatest really Islamic commander of the early 19th century. And he actually serves in a lot of these campaigns. 
Um, although he initially fought against the French, you know, he later kind of copied some of their techniques and tactics. He hired French advisors, and eventually, really, he did learn from kind of the latest in French tactics, drill, discipline, to some extent, technology. So the French influence does last, you know, to some extent. It's not a complete failure. Militarily, though, things begin to break down. Mostly because, again, Nelson destroys the French fleet, the Battle of the Nile in Aboukir Bay. This is in 1798. The French then, they're sort of stranded in a way. You know, they, they have an army of 40,000 men in Egypt. They don't really have enough ships to supply them properly or to send back to France. Um, I mean, Napoleon, it's, it, some of the documents are fascinating. It's like the stuff they wanted to be supplied from France. And it wasn't just what they needed for you know, ammunition and shell for artillery and so on, but they actually requested troops of ballerinas and you know, theatrical comédiennes, and they wanted more women because they realized things weren't going well with the local women, and so they tried to import women. In fact, Napoleon, remember, tried to get Josephine to come with him. He actually sent a ship for her, and she refused to come. And so eventually, he struck up an affair with a French woman. I think her name was Pauline Forez. Uh, she was the one who became known as Napoleon's Cleopatra. Um, and so he's sort of living like, you know, the ancient dream of the conqueror and so on. Except they get a little antsy in Cairo. Remember, the original idea was not to stop in Egypt. It was to go all the way to India. But now they don't really have enough supplies. Napoleon tries to recruit local forces. He makes some headway. Um, they did actually, though, make a couple of interesting maneuvers that had lasting consequences. One, they actually did sketch out the route of what would later become the Suez Canal. Uh, it was not, again, an original French idea. The Ottomans, remember, had planned something similar way back in the 16th century, but nothing had come of it. Um, Napoleon takes it a little more seriously. They do some survey maps. And later on, oddly enough, it is actually the French who mostly build the Suez Canal. Although Britain took control of it, it was actually the French in the 1860s who did most of the surveying work and the planning. So they laid down some plans. Um, Napoleon also invaded Palestine and Syria. The, the Syrian campaign, I mean, there are a couple of episodes here that are of note. Uh, one happened at, at Jaffa, and this is kind of the most notorious episode of the whole campaign. Jaffa, which I think I think is modern Haifa. I always forget which it is. But Jaffa, anyway, they, they do lay siege to the garrison successfully. They give them a chance to surrender. The garrison doesn't surrender, and so Napoleon's men come in and, and shall we say, treat the, uh, you know, the kind of the conquered members of the Ottoman garrison with brutality. Um, eventually, they do accept the surrender of the last 4,000 or so. But then Napoleon has a very painful dilemma. He's got maybe 4,000 to 5,000 prisoners. He's marching an army across Syria. He doesn't have supply. The British control the sea. There isn't enough food, even for his own men. And so, again, to play devil's advocate, he doesn't want to mutiny. He doesn't want to feed his prisoners very well while his own men are complaining. And so he decides to do away with them, cheaply not using bullets. He has them bayoneted and you know, essentially pushed into the water, drowned into the bay. It's kind of the worst, in some ways, war crime of the whole era. Um, maybe to appease his conscience right after this, Napoleon goes and visits a French hospital camp um, where there are also some you know, locals, Ottomans and Egyptians, who are also suffering from plague. And supposedly, he tries to tell everyone that the plague is not contagious, and so he sort of touches the, the prisoners. As it turns out, it actually was contagious, but somehow he miraculously survived. He had, he had a lot of luck, Napoleon. Um, and he has this painted up, you know, this propaganda. Anyway, the French, they do win this battle, but things are starting to look a little uglier. You know, they're, they are now, again, they're winning ugly. Some of the men are complaining. There's some grumbling in the ranks. When they finally make it up to Acha, as I think you call it in Turkish, Acre is what we usually, this was actually, um, it was a crusader settlement, you know, going back to the Crusades. Uh, it was now obviously an Ottoman city run by the notorious uh, Jezar Bey or Jezar Pasha, who was a former Mamluk who had kind of set himself up almost as a local warlord and then eventually been assumed into the Ottoman administration from Damascus as, as you know, a respectable auto 
uh, sorry, Ottoman governor. Um, he was notoriously uh, unpopular among the locals. He treated, you know, he treated his own prisoners very cruelly. Um, and he himself was not necessarily that great a battlefield commander. However, he had a couple of big advantages. One, the city was actually drawn in such a way that it was exceedingly difficult to break through the outer walls. Um, Napoleon successfully laid siege to it, but he was not able to surround it because the British controlled the sea. The British, in fact, knocked off a couple of French supply ships trying to come to Napoleon. The British commander was this Sidney Smith I talked about earlier. The one Napoleon later says, that man cost me my destiny. Again, Napoleon not seeing the Ottoman commander, Jazar Pasha, as you know, being the key man in the battle. You could argue it either way. You can say, well, the grit of you know, the Ottoman soldiers, um, some of them Mamluks, some of them Janissaries inside the town, you know, that they held out very bravely and courageously. But in the end, the battle really was decided by the fact that the Ottomans were very well supplied with ammunition, shell, and supply, and they had the better defensive position because the British kept supplying them. And Napoleon didn't really have enough supplies. So Napoleon actually, I mean, it, well, it was a defeat in the sense that he was not able to enter the town, but his men weren't captured. Many of them died. They conducted a methodical and successful retreat back to Egypt. And then they even won a battle in Egypt at Abukir, um, which was up near Alexandria on the coast. And so, yes, Acha is an Ottoman victory, probably even more than that a British victory. Napoleon was not victorious in that campaign. However, you know, his men were not captured, they weren't dispersed. And so Napoleon was able to claim the whole thing had been a success. They had actually fought one successful battle. It's usually called the Battle of Mount Tabor. And it's true, they had routed the entire army of Damascus of almost 250,000 men in the course of several kind of decisive, punctual battles, very classic Napoleon-style battles, you know, where they had focused their fire on specific points, then they had withdrawn you know, into the square, then they had pursued the, uh, the routed forces. For the most part, again, Napoleon wins most of these battles. It's a little confusing. He loses at Acre, but he wins every other battle, so his reputation is still kind of intact, you know, as a victorious commander. But he doesn't necessarily treat his men terribly well. He decides, essentially after the Battle of Acre, this is why he blames Sidney Smith. He says, that man cost me my destiny. He gives up on the big plan, you know, being modern Alexander of going to India, what have you. And he decides, I think it's time to go back to France. <laughs> it's time to go back to France before everyone in France learns that I've sacrificed 20,000 men and you know, I haven't gained a lot other than the Rosetta Stone. And this was another one of his kind of innate sort of geniuses. He understood public relations. That basically what he needed to do was get back to Paris and control the message. That you see, the Egyptian campaign had actually been a great cultural success. We discovered the Rosetta Stone, and we did all these paintings of the ancient pyramids and other ruins, and you know, we've unearthed all of these secrets of the ancient culture, and our men are victorious and undefeated, etc., etc., etc. A lot of it's kind of true, some of it's lies, but basically it's propaganda. Meanwhile, he leaves behind the French garrison, and it's one of my favorite quotes of the era. The man he leaves in charge, uh, Kleber, famously says, Napoleon left us with you know, our britches full of shit, uh, basically, c'est culotte, plein de merde. And the idea is, as Kleber put it, when we finally get back to France, we're going to wipe his face in it. You know, they're angry. They've been betrayed and abandoned by Napoleon. But most of the men, of course, never make it back to France. They die in Egypt, and so we never get to find out their side of the story. Kleber himself actually dies, too. And eventually, Britain takes over Egypt. Um, again, they laid the seeds for a lot of kind of future consequences. Uh, the Suez Canal and the idea of it. Uh, some of these French reforms, modernization reforms of Kavalala, Mehmet Ali in Egypt. The French sort of claim on Lebanon and Syria, you know, which we see as important, particularly like in the First World War. A lot of this goes back to the Napoleonic period. That said, if you look at it in military terms, the whole thing was kind of a debacle. I mean, you know, the French eventually lost almost an entire army. Yeah, even if they did win most of the battles, eventually most of the men either died of disease or, you know, didn't, didn't really make it through the battles. A lot of them died of acre and so on. Anyway, but Napoleon, he rushes back to France. He controls the message 
And he teams up with some cynical old politicians, Talleyrand, again, the diplomat, he's always kind of part of this. Um, the Abbe Siez, <laughs> who, uh, he was actually, if you remember, the one who had uh, asked this famous question, what is the third estate? It is nothing, you know, it should be everything. Um, well, he's now sort of like grand old man of the revolution, and he's kind of behind the scenes. The directors, this directory government, as I said, was notoriously corrupt. Inflation was running rampant. Um, the whole thing was about to fall apart, really. You know, the popular crowd in Paris was getting antsy. Everyone was afraid that, again, France was going to succumb. Uh, another coalition was forming against France. The Austrians temporarily had even won back some of northern Italy. And so they organized this incredibly cynical coup d'etat. And in some ways, just like the French Revolution set the kind of template for modern revolutions, this coup sets the template for what we call the modern coup d'etat. Coup d'etat, basically like a you know, coup de main, a, just a, a quick grasp of the key logistical points in a city. You know, very cynical, controlling the message, usually arresting your opponents. Now, in Napoleon's case, it's actually interesting. He went into the parliament, the, um, the Conseil des Cinq-Cents, the, the parliament of 500, which, again, was not, didn't really have a lot of power, but it was still it was a symbol of the popular legitimacy of the regime. And he went in there and he gave a speech. But he didn't get to finish the speech because the delegates were so angry at you know, his presumption as the general to be telling them what to do that they actually rushed him and they physically attacked him. And they actually like, molested his person, and in fact, so badly that he was bleeding. He actually had to leave. He had to be like, carried out by his bodyguards. And when he got out on the street, after being attacked by the legitimate democratic representatives of France, he then, this is very much like Caesar style, you know, he called to the mob and he said, gentlemen, there are men in that horrible parliament in the pay of England. He basically said, you know, they're all spies. <laughs> so they arrested them, all 500 of them. They just arrested them. And they said, look, they're all English spies, whatever have you. And then they went around rubber stamping a bunch of decrees, you know, annulling the prior regime, and again, very much setting up the kind of Roman analogy. They decided that they would now dispense with all of France's own parliamentary traditions and set up what they called a consulate, consul. Consul in ancient Rome in the Republican time was, you would have this only for like a year. You know, that way people wouldn't become dictators, you would be consul for a specific term, like one year. And that was the idea, as they put it. And of course, Napoleon, they decided, well, yeah, you can be the consul. And then they said, well, maybe you can be the consul for longer than a year. You can be the consul for five years. And then, of course, in 1802, uh, I think I wrote that up here. Anyway, 1802, uh, he's the first consul, they say, until 1802. Then they call him consul for life. And then, of course, 1804, this is after Napoleon has... Um, it's, it's a bit of a convoluted story, but he had tried, remember the, the revolution had attacked the church, you know, they had seized the church lands. There was a lot of bad blood still with the Catholic church with Rome. And so Napoleon arranged a, a compromise. They called it a concordat, a kind of a compromise with the Catholic church. Sort of religious toleration, but also sort of, um, we'll no longer force you all to be slaves of the atheist government. You know, um, they got rid of the civil constitution of the clergy, and they said, yes, you can consider yourselves, you know, bishops of Rome. But they didn't, it's a little complicated. They didn't go all the way. The government still had certain prerogatives of control over them. But that done, you know, he got the pope to come, and supposedly the pope was going to crown him emperor, except that Napoleon decided to put the crown on his own head, famously. And so he declares himself emperor. And so you can see a kind of almost like a cynicism creeping into French politics. You know, the early days of the revolution, everyone was all full of an idealism and slogans and declaration of the rights of man and citizen, égalité, fraternité. And now you have, you know, a dictator in all but name who puts the own crown on his head. And in order to legitimize his rule, he actually, uh, he holds... A plebiscite, and this again sets a rather disturbing precedent for modern politics to see whether the people approve of him being emperor. And the vote comes in 3,571,329 yes against 2,570 no.
you might call this the sort of uh, uh, suspicious uh, precision of the modern plebiscite. Saddam Hussein held one of these, and I think it came in even more lopsided. You know, it was like 17 people voted against him against like 9,500,000 who voted for him. You get the idea. It's, you know, it's sort of like fake democracy to legitimize uh, the rule of uh, not a tyrant necessarily. Now, that's not to say that Napoleon wasn't popular. I mean, it's an analogy might be with somebody like Putin in Russia the last eight or ten years. Probably the election returns were not legitimate. I don't want to talk about Turkish politics here, but you could probably make an analogy there too. You know, the returns might not be 100% accurate. You know, they're, obviously, he didn't really get this percentage of the vote. That said, he probably was popular. I mean, as you would think. After all, Napoleon has turned France into this great power. Um, although, you know, there were yet more coalitions. He routed most of the armies. There were, uh, he routed the Austrians again in 1800. Um, he defeated a British expeditionary um, uh, army in 1801. There was a kind of temporary peace lasting a couple of years. Then Britain went back to war with him again in 1803. You know, they start assembling various potential armadas to invade England for a couple of years. None of them ever quite come through. Another coalition forms. You know, he beats the Prussians at Jena, the Austrians at Ulm, Austerlitz, the Russians at Friedland. By roughly this point, like by 187, Napoleon is not just emperor of France, but he's really kind of the master of Europe. I mean, you have here, in some of your readings, uh, if you have the Kennedy book, I think this is a better map, actually. This is on page... 128 of Kennedy. Uh, you also have in the other book a map towards the end. It's, it's a little bit more confusing because of the colors. Let me just see here. Yeah, you have a two-page map, but it's a little harder to read because of the way the shading worked. This is in your, your other reading, your textbook reading. Yeah, page uh, 130, right, 134, um, if you do have the reading with you. You know, you can look at both maps. They're, they're not quite the same, but they're very similar. Uh, Napoleon, kind of the height of his power, either 1810 or 1812. You can see now that he's expanded the actual territory of France to include much of northern Italy. Corsica, remember, was already French. Uh, he's expanded, he's basically annexed the Netherlands or Holland. Um, now that's interesting in and of itself, in that uh, one of his brothers was actually ruling Holland, and then he got angry that his brother was not taking his orders. Now, partly because of something called the Continental System. You know, the two, the two sort of key, quote-unquote, policies Napoleon is associated with regarding both domestic and then international affairs. The Code Napoleon was the legal code, very famous, uh, stamping out the... Um, uh, the, the, the kind of contradictions between a feudal European traditional medieval law and the Roman law, which was the basis for a lot of modern civil law. It wasn't as progressive as it sometimes made out. It's true that in a lot of countries it still forms the basis of civil law in Europe today. There were aspects of it, though, that were distinctly reactionary, including, I think I mentioned this before, the re-legalization of slavery. And there was also even some backsliding on women's rights, which had been an ideal in the revolution. Never full equality for women. Uh, you know, the, the authority of the man over essentially the marriage household was still pretty absolute under the code. Um, even some rights of illegitimate children and single women were reduced. For the most part, though, the idea of it was equality before the law. That is, getting rid of all the old social distinctions, you know, people being born into different ranks, Mortmain, all the rest. I mean, this was the French argument when they were, again, liberating other countries, is that they were going to standardize the law code and bring equality before the law. Which all sounded nice in theory, but of course, it also meant you had French soldiers pillaging and stealing and robbing, and, and then Napoleon would just set up his own brothers, basically, on most of these thrones. Well, anyway, so uh, Holland, part of the reason Napoleon incorporated it directly into France was that the Dutch kept disobeying. They kept trading. That was to do with the continental system. Basically, Napoleon said that no one in Europe was allowed to trade with Britain. It was, it was kind of a spiteful thing. I mean, he thought that somehow Britain's advantage was unfair. Britain, because it controlled the seas and most overseas trade, was able to strangle Napoleon, you know, with a the blockade. They had, 
basically rolled up most of France's former colonies in places like the Caribbean. Um, actually, in some ways, though, Napoleon shot his own foot. One of the oddest legacies of the Napoleonic era, but one Americans are familiar with, do any of you know what I'm talking about, 183, Napoleon and America? The Louisiana Purchase. The Americans bought pretty much the entire Mississippi River Basin. Uh, Louisiana today is just the state, like in the south, where uh, you know, New Orleans famously is located. But the Louisiana Purchase referred to the entire territory drained by the Mississippi River Basin. Um, millions of acres of land bought for $15 million. In fact, it was an acre, it's a little smaller than I, do you have hectare in Tur Turkish? I forget. Hectare. It's smaller than a hectare, but anyway, it was less than a dollar per hectare, something like 30 cents per hectare of land. Um, some people think this was actually Napoleon's biggest mistake. It's true that because of the British naval blockade, France was not able to keep regular communications and supplies up with his colonies. However, that was partly because Napoleon decided to spend most of his money and time you know, invading Europe, invading Egypt. If France had tried to build an empire in America, I mean, this is like one of the great what-ifs of the Napoleonic era, there's a good chance that modern America would speak French, you know, a little bit like Quebec does today. Instead, he said, look, I'll just sell it for a song. Forget about it. The British are probably going to control America, or the Americans will. I mean, as it turned out, the British and Americans even fought a war in 1812. This was because of this whole controversy over trade, the continental system. Uh, for, for America, from uh, one of the, uh, the, the earliest and the key principles of American foreign policy has always been freedom of the seas, which is to say the freedom to trade. And both Napoleon and Britain were interfering in this. Napoleon because he was not allowing people to trade with Britain in Europe, and the British because they were blockading Europe, um, particularly trying to blockade any you know, French commerce, which would benefit France. Well, so Holland, along with a lot of countries like along the coast, they're violating this uh, egregiously, you know, through smuggling and that sort of thing. And so Napoleon rolls up Holland into his empire. Um, theoretically, all of his kind of, you know, his allies and satraps, like the Austrians and the Prussians, these territories are all, again, they are supposed to be allied to France, even though it's clear that they're pretty hostile. Um, Russia temporarily is, is sort of like an equal, almost ally of France between 1807 and 1812. Um, the Russian question, though, this is another one of the great what-ifs of the Napoleonic era, again, kind of mistakes Napoleon makes. Um, I alluded a little bit to the, the sort of, it's a fun topic, you know, Napoleon's love life, right? Josephine never bears him a son, um, or any children, really. Again, possibly because she was barren. Um, this is significant for a couple of reasons, not just because Napoleon keeps getting angry with her and so on. And yeah, he has lots of affairs, of course. But the thing is, if you're an emperor, you really sort of need sons. <laughs> I mean, you know, you need heirs, right? Or else, you know, how are you going to secure your legacy, your legitimacy? Yes, he puts his brother up as, you know, his one brother is like, you know, king of Rome, another brother is king of Holland, another brother is king of Spain, you know, this and that. But, you know, those are brothers, and their thrones are really only secure so long as French arms are triumphant. If you really want to be a, a legitimate, you know, kind of emperor with a succession, a hereditary succession, you need sons. And Napoleon doesn't have any. So it's kind of frustrating. Eventually, and this is part of his deal with the Catholic Church, again, there are various compromises, he divorces Josephine. Divorce, remember, is not supposed to be allowed by Catholics. This is one of the things he insisted on in his negotiations with them. And, um, and he starts searching around for another wife. Um, he tries to cut a deal. This is very, uh, a very famous episode with the Russian Tsar Alexander I. The French have defeated the Russians on the battlefield, but you know, Russia being a huge country with an immense population, he realizes he's not going to knock the Russians out very easily, and so he tries to negotiate a deal. What is proposed, and some of this is rumor and conjecture, but supposedly the British had a spy aboard the boat on which they were negotiating. And according to this spy, they were going to divide the world up between them. Um, although, well, supposedly on Napoleon's side, what he objected to was that Alexander I 
insist on having Tsargrad, as the Russians referred to Constantinople, Istanbul, the second Rome. And Napoleon's brother said, no, 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 that would make you emperor of the world. I cannot stand that. From the other side, though, the deal, basically they were going to team up carve up the Ottoman Empire and destroy British India and the British Empire. That was the idea, anyway. Um, this is, incidentally, the incident which is usually said to have given birth to the so-called great game rivalry between Britain and Russia. The idea that the British were afraid that Russia was going to, you know, again, conquer British India. Um, the other problem, though, the, the thing that got in the way here was that Napoleon thought they should solidify their alliance with a marriage. So he wanted to marry Romanov princess, as it turned out, the Tsar's sister. And the Tsar said, no. He said, no, you know, largely on principle. I mean, he was a fairly conservative Orthodox Christian, you know, who was also representative of one of the most ancient dynasties in Europe. And he saw Napoleon as someone he had to deal with, but an upstart, basically, you know, a pretender. The fact that Napoleon didn't have a son yet you know, I don't know if that reflected on him personally, but the Tsar probably in some sense didn't entirely approve of Napoleon. So he did not allow Napoleon to marry his sister. A very interesting what if. Had there been a marriage alliance between, again, the French and the Russians, between Napoleon and the Romanovs, it's hard to see Napoleon invading Russia like he did in 1812. He probably wouldn't have had to. Yes, maybe they would have eventually argued about various things, but probably wouldn't have come to war. So in some ways, it's like right at the height of his power, you know, right around this time of Tilsit, as it's called, the peace treaty between France and Russia. The height of his power, only Britain stands in the way of Napoleon's ambitions. Russia is kind of allied to France. The wheels, you know, in the background are kind of starting to come off. Not just because he is not able to seal this marriage alliance, but another campaign begins at the same time. It's usually called the Peninsular Campaign, and this is in Spain. One of Napoleon's brothers is on the throne in Spain. You know, he has brothers on the thrones of most of these satellite states. The Spanish, though, begin to resist, and they are encouraged by the British. I mean, in some ways, Napoleon, again, he controls Europe. If you look at the map, it's out on the periphery of Europe in both Spain and Russia that he finally meets his problems, perverses. Spain had been kind of like a satellite of France, really, going back over 100 years. Um, and so Napoleon probably saw it that way. Um, the Spanish, though, although their army was no match for Napoleon's forces, what they did was they basically retreated up into kind of like the hills in the countryside, and they fought a guerrilla campaign, you know, a campaign of harassing the French army and their supply lines, sabotage and the like. And they were supported by the British, famously by, uh, it was not yet the Duke, but the man we know to history as the Duke of Wellington. He helped supply the Spanish. The British were able to keep them supplied. Now, the Spanish campaign, it's not like the French lose. It's just, it starts bleeding them. It starts bleeding the treasury. It starts bleeding away some of the strength of the French army. So this is starting to go wrong for Napoleon. In fact, to some extent, Napoleon's idea of invading Russia I don't know where exactly it came from, but it may have come partly from this frustration that the British were still standing in his way. The Russians were also, like the Dutch, they were sort of evading some of the controls of the continental system. Now, that said, the decision to invade Russia was obviously the dumbest and most suicidal decision Napoleon ever made. I mean, if there's one basic law of modern history, I think in the movie of Princess Bride, it was... Um, Never get involved in a land war in Asia. <laughs> in, in this case, you could say never invade Russia. Um, it's not usually a good idea. Now, why did Napoleon invade Russia? Well, maybe it was because the Tsar refused to let him marry his sister. <laughs> maybe it was because he was getting bored. Or maybe, to some extent, it was just because that's what you did, you know, if you were the modern Alexander. I mean, he couldn't just settle down and just be a ruler. I mean, the French government finance is going back now 15, 20 years, to some extent, dependent on plunder. You remember, that's, I mean, that's how Napoleon had financed the Italian campaign, the Egyptian campaign, too. I didn't even talk about this, but he actually paid for the Egyptian campaign by robbing the Vatican and robbing Switzerland. <laughs> they actually went to Bern and they looted the entire treasury of Switzerland. They just stole everything. 
They stole so much gold. This is way back, you know, before the Egyptians came. They stole so much gold that the carriages they were carrying and the floorboards actually broke and it all just like fell onto the ground and they, they had to eventually reinforce the floorboards. So Napoleon, the financial situation of France never really stabilizes. I mean, to some extent, he had to keep conquering new countries. He had to keep looking for more plunder. He was not able to just settle down. Um, some of it, again, resentment against the British because they are still, you know, able to trade and evade his patrols. Some of it probably just out of spite and impatience. And yes, various rumors that the Russians were cooperating with the British and were not really being loyal. They were violating their treaty with Napoleon and so on. Well, anyway, long story short, Napoleon invades Russia at the head of this term, Grande Armée, incidentally. It just literally means the, the French army of, of the Napoleonic era whenever it was put together in like a single force. The number of soldiers was about 650,000, although of these only about 200 and I think 70,000 were French. This is interesting. In some ways it, it is very similar to Hitler's own invasion of the Soviet Union, although that involved over 3 million men where of those, the majority, but just a bare majority, were actually Germans. You know, they were actually relying on a lot of volunteers from elsewhere in Europe or conscripts. Napoleon is, he's no longer that is able to draw on quite the same base of manpower as he previously was just from France. In fact, even, well, no, Clausewitz didn't fight with Napoleon. Clausewitz famously actually went to support the Russian side. Um, he was Prussian, um, but most of the Prussian army actually fought with Napoleon against Russia, although they're not fond of remembering this fact. The French, that is, were able to draw on a large population of allies and mercenaries in the invasion of Russia. But it didn't really go very well. Um, there's actually a new book out. The usual story is, you know, the French, they make it all the way to Moscow, uh, the city is burned down, and so they don't have winter quarters, and so they, they basically like retreat, and you know, old man winter, as it's called. The weather defeats them. People die of frostbite, and they're picked off by the Cossacks. And this and that. There's a new book out, actually, by a Russian historian. It's of Russian origin, although he writes in English, Dominic Levin. You know, basically says, that's not fair to the Russians. The Russians actually fought a brilliant campaign. You know, the Russians, um, after Borodino, they conducted a, a retreat into the countryside. Uh, it was all very, very well organized. They didn't allow the French to have this one decisive battle that they wanted. You know, they picked their spots. They harassed the French at the right time. The story is probably somewhere in between. Some of it, though, I think actually does have to do with the sapping away of the French fighting spirit and French strength. The French, they now had something like two or 300,000 men in Spain just fighting the guerrillas. They were only able, that is, to send 270,000 men into Russia. And meanwhile, a key factor, which is, I think, it's appreciated by military historians, but, I mean, unless you really kind of look at the essence of, of battle before the modern era, you can't understand just how important horses are. It's not just cavalry. It's transport. You know, it's mobility, it's speed, but it's also just being able with pack animals to, you know, keep your army supplied. Something like 200,000 horses died in Napoleon's Russian campaign. Now, it's also said that so many horses had died in his previous campaigns that the quality of the horses was declining, too. So that's a big factor, too. You know, the Russians, they did fight, I think, tactically speaking, a good war. Napoleon overreached himself. Um, and yet again, in a kind of replay of what happened in Egypt, Napoleon, you know, famously gets on his sleigh and rushes back to Paris, <laughs> leaving his men to be picked off by the Cossacks and stragglers. Um, you know, supposedly, I mean, there are a lot of funny legends about it. You know, the sleigh was going so fast that when they got to the German town, I forget the town, in Weimar, I think, where Goethe was born, Napoleon supposedly just kind of tipped his hat and said, give my regards to Monsieur Goethe, and then just kept going. You know, he's just like rushing all the way back to Paris so he can control the message again. Um, was Napoleon finished? Well, not entirely. I mean, amazingly, he still musters an army of several hundred thousand men to fight the Battle of the Nations, as it's called at Leipzig. It's called the Battle of the Nations because for the first time, Napoleon's enemies were using conscription. I talked about the levée en masse, the French version of the draft going back to 1793. This is, again, one of these add-on effects of the French 
Revolution and Napoleon's era. The other European countries begin to copy French methods. They're not going to go so far yet as to have you know, pseudo-democracy and all of the rest, but they realize that they do begin to need to have larger armies, and they need to have something like a national cause. So the Battle of the Nations, much larger armies. I um, think the, um, the Allies muster almost 370,000, and they outnumber the French on the battlefield. Napoleon then goes back, uh, you know, again, he retreats back into France. Now, there's an interesting quote about this time. Uh, I realize we're probably almost to the end of our period. Just a quote to kind of sum up the difference between Napoleon and some of his um, opponents here. During the last days, so to speak, you know, before Napoleon has been, you know, conquered in the final battle at Waterloo, when Napoleon is deciding whether or not to continue the campaign or to negotiate some kind of a compromise treaty, he actually talks to Metternich, the, the diplomat who will become, you know, known for the Vienna settlement after the war. And he actually tells Metternich at one point that he would gladly sacrifice a million men to achieve his objectives. It's interesting that his primary opponent, his principal opponent in the whole era, the Duke of Wellington, he actually said in another context, he said Napoleon's great advantage was that he, he was able to spend lives as freely as he wanted because he was a dictator. Yes, many of the men fought for him because they wanted loot and glory and so on, but basically he didn't have to answer to anybody. Wellington said, look, if I even lost 500 men without the strictest military necessity, that is, without being able to justify why I had lost those men, I would be brought on my knees before the House of Commons in England. Now, the paradox I find so interesting here is not just between the character of a conqueror like Napoleon, but France, remember, this was supposedly the country of revolution and democracy. Yes, it's now like pseudo-democracy, they have these plebiscites. England supposedly was the country of, yeah, they have a parliament, but, you know, the franchise is strictly limited. The ho even the House of Commons is mostly highborn aristocrats and a few rich merchants. The House of Lords, obviously, is all upper-level aristocracy. But in England, whether it was quote-unquote democracy or not, which it probably wasn't by modern standards, you did have accountability. The generals in the field had to answer to the parliament. They had to justify what they were doing. Napoleon did not. So Napoleon could really do almost whatever he wanted with his men. This was an advantage up to a point. But in the end, maybe he wasted too many lives. Because if you look at the long-run consequences of the, of the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars, even though the French made Napoleon into a hero, I mean, after all, he's buried in a great tomb in Paris, France lost so many millions of men in these wars that in a way they never recovered. France's population was stagnant. It, was, it remained virtually the same. It barely grew at all in the 19th century at a time when England's population tripled the population of Russia multiplied by almost four. France's population barely increased a notch because so many men of childbearing age were killed in these wars. And in some ways, maybe the morale of the country, I think, cracked for good. So France, at the end of the wars, even though they didn't lose that much territory, they began their long, slow decline into what we might call second rank or second class status among the European powers. Um, I know we're out of time, though, so uh, I think you all had a chance to look at your exam scores. If anyone still wants to see their exams, you can come up now and maybe take a brief look. Um, one note about next week's midterm, I will have on Friday, I'm going to bring, um, I'll, I'll either email it to you or I'll bring it to class, a practice exam. Ottomans, remember, had planned something similar way back in the 16th century, but nothing had come of it. Um, Napoleon takes it a little more seriously. They do some survey maps. And later on, oddly enough, it is actually the French who mostly build the Suez Canal, although Britain took control of it. It was actually the French in the 1860s who did most of the surveying work and the planning. And so they laid down some plans. Um, Napoleon also invaded Palestine and Syria. The, the Syrian campaign, I mean, there are a couple of episodes here that are of note. Uh, one happened at, at Jaffa, and this is kind of the most notorious episode of the whole campaign. Jaffa, which I 
think is modern Haifa. I always forget which it is. But Jaffa, anyway, they, they do lay siege to the garrison successfully. They give them a chance to surrender. The garrison doesn't surrender, and so Napoleon's men come in and, and shall we say, treat the, uh, you know, the kind of the conquered members of the Ottoman garrison with brutality. Um, eventually, they do accept the surrender of the last 4,000 or so. But then Napoleon has a very painful dilemma. He's got maybe 4,000 to 5,000 prisoners. He's marching an army across Syria. He doesn't have supply. The British control the sea. There isn't enough food, even for his own men. And so, again, to play devil's advocate, he doesn't want to mutiny. He doesn't want to feed his prisoners very well while his own men are complaining. And so he decides to do away with them, cheaply not using bullets. He has them bayoneted and you know, essentially pushed into the water, drowned into the bay, out of the Nile. Understandably, because obviously France was much stronger, but you see, that was kind of the point in a way. France was now able to occupy the richest of all the Ottoman provinces, more or less at will, it seemed. I mean, after all, this was an army of the Battle of the Pyramids, just 20,000. The entire French army by this stage was 600,000. So it was just a tiny portion of the French army. Now, that said, they did eventually lose. I mean, they, they spend a year in Egypt. And like I said, they did a lot of stuff. I mean, they, again, the Rosetta Stone allowing them to decipher hieroglyphics because it was a little bit like one of those Bibles where they had print in three different languages, like the famous Ladino Bible of the early 16th century. Um, it took them a while to figure it out, but some of the scholars with a kind of British team, they did eventually decipher the Rosetta Stone, allowing them to, again, read ancient hieroglyphics. They made all kinds of discoveries of ruins and so on. Meanwhile, they're setting up these kind of cultural and scientific institutes in Egypt. You know, they're trying to kind of Frenchify the country um, to bring their own idea, idea of civilization to Egypt. Um, there's a culture clash, though. Not just is there a major uprising at the al Azhar Mosque that the French suppress with great brutality, um, but actually there, there's some fascinating interchange, particularly regarding uh, women. Uh, you know, again, not least because for the Egyptians, it's kind of shocking to see th there aren't that many French women who come along, but there are a few. And they're a little shocked to see the French women, you know, with their décolletage and, you know, showing skin and all of this. But meanwhile, the French, too, are a little bewildered by the fact that discipline, to some extent, technology. So the French influence does last, you know, to some extent. It's not a complete failure. Militarily, though, things begin to break down. Mostly because, again, Nelson destroys the French fleet, the Battle of the Nile in Aboukir Bay. This is in 1798. The French, then, they're sort of stranded in a way. You know, they, they have an army of 40,000 men in Egypt. They don't really have enough ships to supply them properly or to send back to France. Um, I mean, Napoleon, it's, it, some of the documents are fascinating. It's like the stuff they wanted to be supplied from France. You know, it wasn't just what they needed for you know, ammunition and shell for artillery and so on, but they actually requested troops of ballerinas and you know, theatrical comedian, and they wanted more women because they realized things weren't going well with the local women, and so they tried to import women. In fact, Napoleon, remember, tried to get Josephine to come with him. He actually sent a ship for her, and she refused to come. And so eventually, he struck up an affair with a French woman. I think her name was Pauline Forez. Uh, she was the one who became known as Napoleon's Cleopatra. Um, and so he's sort of living like, you know, the ancient dream of the conqueror and so on. Except they get a little antsy in Cairo. Remember, the original idea was not to stop in Egypt. It was to go all the way to India. But now they don't really have enough supplies. Napoleon tries to recruit local forces. He makes some headway. Um, they did actually, though, make a couple of interesting maneuvers that had lasting consequences. One, they actually did sketch out the route of what would later become the Suez Canal. Uh, it was not, again, an original French idea. The, you know, the women have to be you know, hidden in these kind of robes and you know, obviously kind of like the, the flowing burqas and so on. That said, there are some Egyptian women who venture into the French camp. And Napoleon at one point, as the story goes, was worried about discipline because too many of the local women were 
you know, basically kind of like entertaining the French soldiers in camp. And he didn't want to create a cultural incident, and so you know, he went to the local Ah, the kind of police chief in Cairo, and he said, look, I'm having some discipline problems in the army, so you know, can you please deal with the problem? Make sure that the women don't you know, enter the French camp. And there might have been something getting lost in translation, because what the Ah did was he took all of these women and had them drowned in the Nile. Or as the tradition went, they were thrown in sacks and then drowned in the Nile. And Napoleon, I mean, for all his faults, was sort of a lover of women, we must say, and he was not terribly happy about this. So there were all kinds of cultural friction and tensions, and the French at first thought that they would be welcomed. Obviously, that wasn't true. Um, then they ruled by force, to a certain extent by terror. Yes, they had some help, obviously, from you know, ambitious locals. And they did put down some roots. I mean, you know, I think Mehmet Ali is probably Kavallala. You know, he is the great, in some ways the greatest, really, Islamic commander of the early 19th century. And he actually serves in a lot of these campaigns. Um, although he initially fought against the French, you know, he later kind of copied some of their techniques and tactics. He hired French advisors, and eventually, really, he did learn from kind of the latest in French tactics drilled. Okay, so, we left off roughly at the Battle of the Pyramids. Now, now I talked about the entire Egyptian campaign as far as when Napoleon is there is really only from 1788 to 1789. I mean, in a way, it's just, it's a blip in his own personal history. It's a blip in the history of France, but at least for the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic world, it is... You might call it a moment of reckoning. Um, there were other campaigns, too, simultaneously. Uh, France was conquering what were then called the Illyrian provinces. Um, you know, essentially what we would consider today to be sort of the, uh, the southern Balkans or the westernmost reaches of Ottoman Rumeli, the European provinces, uh, roughly what is now kind of uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Albania. Um, there was some fighting there. There was some fighting on the Ionian Islands in the Adriatic. Um, that is where, in fact, so egregious was this sort of insult to the Ottoman Empire, so great was the Napoleonic threat now that the Ottomans actually allied with Russia for several years. And they actually fought a joint campaign against the French in the Adriatic. Um, it must be said, though, the Ottomans, like all of the other countries forming these various coalitions, they were somewhat opportunistic. They didn't declare war on France until after Nelson had sunk the French Navy at the 